Okay, we've been talking about what would Jesus teach, looking at the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Today we're going to look at Sardis, and we go to chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. Here's what we read. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains as it is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed and thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, if we just look on a map, we will locate Sardis in that location. I um, want to begin with some background. Uh, this is really an interesting ancient city. Perhaps, uh, perhaps has greater influence in that ancient world than do some of the others that we've already looked at. First of all, Sardis was built high uh, above a plain. It uh, was a great, uh, of great military significance because it was such a difficult city to conquer. It was so impenetrable. It was located on a highway, uh, which also then made it a center of commerce. So it was uh, endowed with great wealth, a military stronghold. It served as the capital of the powerful and wealthy Lydian Empire, which now is modern Turkey. And there's a picture of some of the ruins at Sardis. What happened is the people began to consider themselves to be unconquerable. Uh, th th that, their, that their military might made them impenetrable. There was a single access point into the ancient city. It was a narrow neck of land that was lied to the south. Uh, and that was all that they had to do to defend themselves, was to have force enough to defend that narrow little strip of land. However, what they had not anticipated is that anyone would have the military thought to send its troops at night up the back cliff and to climb up a cliff. And so, as a result of that, the city was actually conquered two or three times because of a night invasion that, uh, that utilized that particular tactic. One of the things that was amazing about this ancient, uh, this ancient city is that it was a source of, uh, of gold. As a matter of fact, some of the purest gold and silver coinage ever made was made at Sardis. They had such tremendous amounts of gold that it became utilized uh, in very extravagant ways. Again, attributing to the wealth of this community some of that attitude of being inconquerable. It was the center of manufactured uh, carpets and woolen goods. Also, it was the site of a large bathhouse gymnasium, uh, which was a, a great uh, five-acre complex that we're going to show you in just a minute here. There was a river, and, and probably most people would call it a stream, that ran near this city that had uh, great sources of gold. Already mentioned that, uh, that gold was in such abundance, but the reason was because of the gold dust that, uh, that was available in this stream. And so all they had to do was to go to this stream and gather up that gold. And so it made uh, for coinage of the highest weight of pure gold uh, of all time. This is said to be the beginning place of coinage. Uh, that Sardis was actually the place where that all began. Its citizens were the richest in the world. Here's a couple of things that are just amazing. Uh, that first picture is a picture of gold earplugs. Gold earplugs. I guess they used that when they were using their crosscut saw. Actually, those gold earplugs were found in a skeleton. So it was, it was part of their eternal journey that they put those gold earplugs on. The other, uh, the other picture, appliques of gold that would have been so, sewn onto garments. And so, uh, again, tremendous wealth in this city. Uh, this, was, this was far from an impoverished place. Here's that gymnasium slash synagogue, five acres, uh, five acres in size. This was actually a place where, 
where the Roman youth uh, took their final step into adulthood. They, they would bring them to this place. They would physically train them. Uh, they would develop them physically to, to prepare them for what came, what came next. Notice some of the intricate work that's, uh, that's displayed in this uh, gymnasium. And along the side there, you see there was also a, a synagogue, a place for a synagogue. The temple of Artemis, who would be Diana in Roman terms, the daughter of Zeus, the twin of Apollo, it was located in Sardis. Uh, it is one of the seven largest Greek temples that was ever built. To give you some idea, it's, twi it's more than twice the size of the Parthenon. So th this temple was huge. Again, this city had extravagant resources, and so everything they did uh, was exorbitant and designed to show their wealth. The Jewish synagogue that was discovered here, one of the largest synagogues ever discovered, located right in the middle of the city, which is kind of unusual because normally a synagogue was built around the periphery. So the fact that the Jewish synagogue sat right in the middle of Sardis is a testimony to the wealth of the Jews. It is also a testimony to their standing in the government. You'll see uh, the little diagram here on the right-hand side. That's called Solomon's Knot. And that's actually a mosaic that was found, discovered within the floor of that synagogue. Solomon's Knot, it's questionable about its, its origin, but perhaps one of the things it suggested is that it shows the tie between knowledge and understanding that, that Solomon exhibited. So, The Jews were well off in this city. Sardis was a wealthy city known for its splendor and luxury. In 133, it, became a, it fell under Roman rule and was designated as one of the 27 principal judicial districts of Rome. After the 6th century, Sardis began to decline in importance and size, and although its prestigious standing lingered uh, for about 500 years after that. So this place was, was so well known, was so wealthy, that even as it began to deteriorate, it still had, it still had standing for 500 years as being Sardis, this magnificent city. As Jesus has John write to this church, he identifies, first of all, their strength. He, uh, he talks about the fact that uh, their works proclaim spiritual life and that there are a few people who have unsoiled garments. We look in chapter 3, the first verse, and to the angel of the church of Sardis write the words of him who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive. Then we look at verse 4. You, uh, yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white. So part of what gets praised here is this is a congregation that has a reputation of being workers, and it's a, it's a congregation where there are some who have not corrupted their garments. Some of uh, the, the Christians in Sardis remain true to their, to their faith. Uh, because they were free of guilt, they were clothed in white and said to walk with Jesus and that their names will never be erased from the book of life. The message that is coming to this group is one that comes from the seven spirits of God. Remember uh, Jesus uh, in the first chapter represented uh, as that and the seven stars who are the messengers that are bringing these. Uh, Sardis has a reputation of spiritual life. Interesting word in the Greek because it's the word for name. Uh, you have a name of being alive. Now, the word, uh, and again, we studied it not too terribly long ago, the word actually not only means name, but it, it, it in, a, in a sense, represents the character that that name holds. So when we talk about doing something in the name of Jesus, it's not just in Jesus' physical name, but it's in the character and the personality of Jesus that things get done. So what Jesus says to Sardis is, you have been characterized as a people who, who are involved in, in work, that you, uh, you have this, uh, this great uh, manifestation, a reputation of spiritual life. However, and we're going to find this at Sardis, there's a difference between having a reputation and deserving a reputation. They have a reputation, is what Jesus says in his initial address. There are some whose garments remain clean and unspotted. James chapter 1 and verse 21, the King James uses that same terminology, that uh, pure religion is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and 
to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So the analogy is that the world holds the power to spot the garments of those who have been cleansed. But what Jesus said at Sardis, there are some people, some believers, who have not allowed themselves to be spotted by the world. The word that John uses carries the idea of being soiled. What is interesting, though, is that the root word from which it comes is the word black. So everything that comes to your mental facility when you think of, of a soiled garment, something dirty, uh, you, know, you probably need to intensify it because this is talking about black on a white garment. So some of them had soiled their garments, others had not. It's possible to remain true to God's calling even within a body that has largely corrupted their walk with God. That's an important lesson here. There are no perfect churches. They don't exist. We as individuals might observe what we consider to be spots on other people's garments, but that does not keep us from walking and living in such a way as to keep our own garment free from being spotted. And that's one of the lessons from Sardis. Okay, now we're going to start the challenge. And that's all we're going to do today is start this because we're going to continue it next time. You have the reputation of being alive. But what Jesus says is, but you're dead. But you're dead. To the angel of the church at Sardis write, the words of him who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a reputation of being alive, but, he says, you are dead. A dead church, interesting to think about. I'm going to let you help me think about it, okay? Again, this is a technology blow-away day. We're going to take an electronic survey. If you have any device on you that you can get on the Internet with, a phone, a tablet of any kind, get it out and get ready because you're going to be able to take a survey and we'll be able to watch the results. If it all works, we'll be able to watch the results uh, right here. This In 1992, I took my kids to my Fedora stomping grounds in hopes of being able to show them uh, some of the stuff that, if you've been around very long, you've heard me talk about Fedora and the Dirty Farm and Grandpa Ross and all those good things. So I was hoping to be able to spur them with some of my childhood memories. One of the things that, uh, that we encountered, we went to Fedora, went to the house that Grandma and Grandpa lived in in Fedora, and then we, we headed out towards the Dirty Farm. Which in the process of making that, uh, that journey, we went the way that took us by what's called the, uh, the Glenview Church. So as we're headed to the Dirty Farm, we come by the Glenview Church. It uh, has not been used for a number of years. It's boarded up. And the amazing thing is, in front of, in front of the church building, they've erected a tombstone. Okay. One should never trust technology. <laughs> so, there's a picture of the Glenview Church <laughs> with a tombstone that says it died in 1983. And so that became the fodder for a newspaper article that I was writing at the time in Montana about a dead church. And it's just interesting to contemplate what a dead church means. Does it mean people don't meet in that building anymore and so you put up a tombstone? I want to, uh, to end by, by, by talking about the fact that there are um, four different stages that have been identified that describe the life of a church. And those who study church growth have identified these four areas, and perhaps uh, you're familiar, maybe they've used other terms. But the first is called the movement stage, the movement stage. This is where that the people who are a part of, this, uh, of that body you know, feel like they are part of a movement. There, there's, a, there's a sense of urgency, there's a sense of, of uh, excitement, because we have escaped the, uh, uh, the chains of sinfulness, 
we have escaped religious traditions, and here we are, and this is just an exciting thing. And so that's called the movement stage. During the movement stage, groups are usually small, which makes them intimate by necessity. It also is a time during the movement stage when commitment is basically 100% across the board. If you have a Sunday morning Bible class, everybody's there. If you have worship, everybody's there. If you have Sunday night, everybody's there. If you do a potluck in the afternoon, everybody's there. If you have Wednesday night, everybody's there. If you say Friday night, we're all going to meet at the building and go to a movie, everybody comes. Because commitment to this movement is basically 100%. Now, as I mentioned, that's usually when congregations are smaller. Uh, attendance is, uh, is not an issue. People spend time together in fellowship as well as uh, in their homes. The second stage is called the magnificence stage. The magnificent stage. This is a time during uh, when the masses increase. The numbers grow. And so when, when the group was small and when the group was a movement, you dreamed about the possibility of being able to do certain things. But your dreams also had to be coupled with personnel, finance. A number of issues came into, into play there that made some of that impossible. But during the stage of magnificence, the numbers have increased, so you now have personnel. The, the contributions, the funds have increased, so now you have that as well. And so great things begin to get accomplished during the stage of magnificence. However, during the stage of magnificence, commitment begins to decrease. And it, it ranges at about 70% during this time. So although now more things are being done, the commitment of those involved has decreased during this stage. There is still this, this vision of intensity and this desire uh, to achieve. The next stage is called the monument stage. The monument stage. Still engaged in growth activities, but the language is expression more of the past than it is of the future. So all you have to do is listen to conversations and what you will hear will reflect past things rather than future focus. Uh, because of the lack of future focus, one of the things that develops during the stage of, of monument is there's a lot of power struggles begin to develop. You know, and people begin to, to try to, to, to put themselves in a, in a position of power. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of struggles that way. Some of the discussion, uh, again, some of our language during this stage of, of church life, we'll, we'll talk about my church or our church. And those terms will be used not in, in, the church, in the sense of ownership, but to be used because there are some new people. You know, and they need to know about our church. That's not how we do things in my church or our church. And that all begins to happen during this, this monument stage. Now, commitment level during monument stage dives and ranges around 30%. 30%. So when we start talking about that small group that any time there was anything, everybody was involved in. Now, we've got this monument stage, and lo and behold, about 30%. About 30% get involved. And the last stage, uh, we're going to call the mausoleum stage. <laughs> the mausoleum stage. By this time, people have drifted away. Uh, attendance levels now drop can drop as low as 10% of people that are actually on, uh, on the roll. During the monument stage, any new people, uh, if and when they come, are always viewed with suspect, as though they're trying to take over something, uh, want to reestablish something. We, uh, we typically, I think, most of us would say, you know, if you reach the mausoleum stage, obviously that would describe a dead church. So, because we don't have a survey to find out where you were at, 
I do want you to contemplate what you think a dead church is. Did it work? Oh, it just didn't project. Thank you, Chris. Okay, any guesses as to what uh, tops the list? Number five, lacks meaningful worship, 79%. 0% lacks updated facility. 13% uh, attendance at 25% of the roll. 3% is uh, over 65% elderly folks. And 3% is within a dying community. So the vast majority said sign of a dying church is what happens in worship time. So I do want you to think about that. Because next time, we'll begin with focusing on a dead church. Okay, let's see.